Leadership has evolved. Uh, I was provocative in saying leadership is dead, but what I, what I did with the students is to say really leadership as we imagine it in political arenas is dead. Leadership has become very much about followership in our politics. But in business, leadership is actually very much alive and well. And the irony I was trying to point out is that the thing that killed political leadership social media and the advent of the internet and so forth is actually an enabler in business because it allowed the C-suite, for example, to emerge from its corner and to really engage with the audiences that matter for their businesses, from their employees to their communities, to their shareholders, to their regulators and the governments. And really the importance of being real, authentic, telling a story became so much more of an opportunity for businesses. So my, my message to the students was, is you're operating in a new environment, but one in which you should be comfortable being a leader about more than just your business, but what greater good you can do. Take someone like uh, George Cope, uh, Ivy grad, uh, just recently announced that he's going to be stepping down as CEO of Bell in uh, January 2020. Uh, George is, is instrumental in, in just tackling mental health as an issue. Now, it's not what, what, what you know, Bell's mantra is, it's not what its mandate is, it's not what it was known for, but they decided that they were going to tackle a social issue because there was a void of leadership and there was an opportunity to, to bring about um, a conversation with Canadians. And it was a bold, seems strange to say this, but it was a bold and courageous decision to take on that issue, mental health, because of stigmas and so forth. But that leadership, the notion of we can do good, uh, and, and, and guess what? Doing good can sometimes be good for your business too. And that's part of the lessons over the last 10 years of the Let's Talk program is they were able to say mental health is something that was prevalent throughout society. It's something that is a productivity issue and that we can't simply let it you know, fester. We have to do something about it. But you didn't need a government to tell you to do that. You didn't need anybody to tell you to do that. In the case of George, it was his mother. You know? And so it came from a very personal place and it's all about character in that sense. I, I always come here with a great sense of hope that I'm going to learn something and sure enough these students didn't let me down. Uh, the takeaway I have is, and it's a, it's a challenge for all of us, it's not a commentary about Ivy at all, but it's, I think it's a commentary on business schools writ large. If you look at business schools in many parts of the world, there is an integration that takes place between sort of the political arena in which they're operating and the business arena in which they're operating. I think we tend to segregate that a little bit here in Canada and what I learned from particularly the international students who were here is they do feel that not having an understanding of how the politics works limits their ability to determine how they're going to be a successful business leader. And the reality is they're not separate uh, entities. They don't operate in vacuums. On the contrary, they're extremely integrated and there's a regular interaction between government and business and so we need to get them to talk to each other. Uh, I, I often s used to say in my, my previous iteration uh, working at Hill and Moulton that, that you know, daddy's a translator, I would tell my kids when they were little, and that, that these are in fact a, 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 an interpretation role is required because government is in, in AM frequency and business is in FM frequency. Sounds good, but they just don't meet. And so this is a great learning for me that we need to do a better job of making sure that our kids and our business programs are learning about about the political arena but are also those who are studying political science and others are learning about the business arena so there's an understanding from which to build better public policy. What we face in Canada is a cultural challenge. We are a very comfortable, very complacent, and sometimes cocky country. And that may make us feel good, but we need to have a strategy to compete. You know, when we last did the Winter Olympics in Canada, we had this own the podium, and it was almost like un-Canadian to think that we would be going for a gold medal. Well, if we've got gold medal athletes, let's support them to win the gold medal. That's the backdrop in which I think we need to look at countries and say, what if just hypothetically, a country was, all the countries in the world were required to have a spec drawn up, then they're gonna do an IPO. You know, we all hear about IPOs and businesses. Let's say the countries had to do an IPO and lay out what is your current economic situation? What are your demographics? What is your deficit situation? What is your debt situation? What are your infrastructure programs like? Where are you on, on you know, the digital infrastructure and so forth? how would we compete against other countries? And would you buy this stock or would you buy other stock? And I think unfortunately the answer for some, and it pains me to say this because I'm a very proud 
Canadian. But the odds are, at best, you would short Canadian stock. You, you wouldn't buy it and hold it because the demographics are very bad. Some of the fundamentals on our economy aren't that strong. The a dramatic bump in interest rates would really expose us to what we've already been through. So what can we do to use that moment, because it's a hypothetical moment, it's not actually going to happen, but say, let's get ahead of it. Let's build an economic plan for prosperity and for growth, because that's the best way to hedge against some of the stuff that's going on around the world ever arriving at our shores. Well, the big goal here is uh, the country needs to recognize that um, it's a very, very competitive world out there. And by the country, I mean Canadians. We need to recognize that countries are making decisions to accelerate their economic growth, to compete for capital, to compete for human resources. And our politics, unfortunately, is more polarized than it's been before. Uh, there's a lot of attention being paid to what I would call small ball issues. We're not really dealing with fundamentals of the country in terms of our economic growth. There's a, a philosophy that we just need to redistribute wealth. The reality is never before have people been as mobile uh, in terms of human resources and never before has capital been as mobile. Every day people are making choices. Do I want to invest in Canada or do I want to invest somewhere else? Do I want to move to Canada? Do I want to, you know, do I want to move somewhere else? So we are providing what we think is uh, an answer to the void of political leadership in the center, the pragmatic, progressive, centrist vision of the country that says we can build a better Canada. We don't have to compromise our values, but we need to have a plan. We need to have an economic strategy for growth because the issues that are going to be permeating in the country are not unique. They happened in the UK, they happened in America, they've happened in parts of Europe. Let's not let that come to our shores. And our leaders, our CEOs are saying, this is not just about my business. I need the country to do well. And so we're asserting ourselves in a role of leadership like perhaps never seen before, uh, certainly not in a long time, and saying we're going to step up and we're going to talk about a Canada, its social issues, its political issues, its economic issues, in a nonpartisan way, but, but to put the country's interests above all else.